you'd like to do it, um, we can take care of you at the tables in the back afterwards. This is a good faith affirming family magazine and we've had a lot of articles about dinosaurs specifically, but a lot of other subjects also. Thank you also for those of you who signed up for our, our what we call Info Bites, our weekly newsletter. If you didn't get that earlier and you would like to, just go to the back and we'll have a sign-up form there. Essentially, once a week we identify something interesting in the world of science and we make sure that it goes out on email to the people on our list. So that is there for you to take advantage of if you like. Okay, you ready for the first question? What's a dinosaur? How's a dinosaur different than a lizard, or a crocodile, or a turtle? Well, dinosaurs are a unique group of reptiles. All the reptiles alive today, except for snakes, their legs stick out to the side. But dinosaurs stood up. So an alligator, if he wants to chase you, he's got to do a push-up and run, and when he's tired, he rests on his belly again. Dinosaurs stood. They also have different patterns of holes in their skull, but what we know from their skeleton morphology is that they are not the same as other reptiles. Did you just learn something? Okay. Next question. What happened to the dinosaurs? I wrote an article several years ago, dinosaurs are almost certainly extinct. I wanted to Right, the title, Dinosaurs Are Extinct, Get Over It. But my boss said, no, Rob, t tone it down a little bit. Um, Creation Ministries International, over the decades, we have published articles about living dinosaurs. But that was 30 years ago. And as the young Turk in the organization, I looked around and said, guys, um, yeah, we had to report on these, for these accounts. People were claiming none of them have been verified. And we now have satellites that can see animals from space. You go on Google Earth, you can see animals on Google Earth. Um, there's no evidence that dinosaurs are alive right now. They might be there, great. I'll be the first person online at the zoo to see a dinosaur if we find one, but we haven't. So I recommend it to CMI that we take this subject, put it to the side, I want it to be true. I have no evidence it's true. As a scientist, I have to present people evidence that I can defend. And matter of fact, testimony is not defensible. You go to a court of law, oh, she did this, no, I didn't, he did it. I mean, verbal testimony is a disaster in science. So until proven otherwise, I'm just gonna conclude that they're extinct. Yeah, wait, wait a second now. What does the evolutionary community say about the extinction of dinosaurs? What killed them? Oh, an asteroid. Maybe, maybe a comet, maybe a meteor. They argue about that. Hit the Yucatan Peninsula. Does anyone know how long ago? In the evolutionary model, well granted, biblical model, it's only a few thousand years old. The evolutionary model, they say, how long ago did the dinosaurs go extinct? It's a number we need to know so we can understand the arguments. 65 million years ago. Does anyone know when in the geologic column that happened? It was at the end of the Cretaceous era. So you had the Mesozoic, you have the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. The dinosaurs went extinct in their model at the end of that. Now, a lot of secular paleontologists say, no, that's not true. They are already in decline before that. Some of them say, no, they lived after that also. So there's arguing in the scientific community. But in the fossil record, there's a pretty big disjunction between what's below the Cretaceous and what's above the Cretaceous. A lot of creationists want to put the flood, post-flood boundary right there. I used to be like that also, but um, th 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 it is problematic. Even though there's a great break between the types of fossils, too much geological activity has to happen afterwards. I mean, we're talking you know, some place a mile of sediment after the flood. Here's another question. What did kill the dinosaurs? Global cooling? Global warming? Poison from the asteroid impact? And if all these dinosaurs died, how come turtles survived? How come crocodiles survived? 
how come butterflies survived? Well, wait a minute. This is a very strange picture here. Because there's great diversity of animals. Some of them swam, some of them, actually no. The mosasaurs are not dinosaurs, the pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. Pterodactylus and other flying, uh, Quetzalcoatlus, the flying reptiles, they have different bone structures. They're actually a different group of, of reptiles than dinosaurs are. But dinosaurs, they were big, they were little, they are meat eaters or plant eaters, they lived all over the place, all these different places. What could kill off only them and not kill off all these other animals that are totally familiar to us today? Because they're still alive today. Beats me. The secular paleontologist doesn't know either. That makes no sense if you consider that butterflies survived the extinction of the dinosaurs. That's a very strange statement. Biblically, God would have created dinosaurs. Dinosaurs would be on Earth during uh, the pre-flood era. And then that dinosaurs would have been caught in Noah's flood along with so many other organisms and killed. Maybe dinosaurs could not adapt to the post-flood world. I don't really have a good answer for that. Are you uncomfortable with me saying I don't know something? Do you realize that scientists never say that? No, that's a new, no true Scotsman fallacy. Most scientists would never say I don't know. Do you know why? Because it's very uncomfortable for them. First of all, most scientists have been the smartest guy in the room, the smartest girl in the room their entire lives, and they're full of themselves. Second of all, to say, I don't know, might open up Pandora's box of alternate ideas. Okay. Who can name a species of dinosaur? Shout it out. What you got? Tyrannosaurus rex. Brachiosaurus. Triceratops. Brontosaurus is an interesting one. Uh, Brontosaurus was in a New York Museum of Natural History. I've seen it. Um, for a hundred years, it had a skull from a different species on the top of it. They found a skull miles away and just stuck it up on top of it. But after taking the skull off, they're examining the, the bones of Brontosaurus. And they say, okay, these bones are different enough from other sauropods that we can call it its own genus. Bronto and they resurrected Brontosaurus again. Okay, so we just heard four or five. Do you think we can name a thousand species of dinosaurs? Do you think we can name 50? Okay, we're gonna take all the 10 year olds and put them over here and all the adults over here and the adults you will lose. But my point is this, how many species were there? Actually, there's only a few hundred known species of dinosaurs. Just a few hundred. It's not even a thousand. Oh, did they dominate the world? There really weren't that many of them. And the definition of the word species is a problem. As a biologist, I actually follow the evolutionary biological species definition. I say if two things can interbreed, they're the same species. These guys are all dead. Geologists do not use the same species definition as biologists do. A geologist says if two things look different, they're different species. Paleontologists found bones of these animals in the fossil record and didn't know what dogs were, they would never put them in the same species. Because Charles Darwin told us that species change very slowly over millions of years. These things didn't exist 100 years ago. These breeds, there's a, a documentary um, of Charles Darwin and um, it's, it's a movie documentary sort of thing. That famous actor's name I can never remember is, is playing Charles Darwin. And, they're going through this movie and the Darwin family has a golden retriever. <laughs> Goldies did not exist in the 1860s. That's a new breed. By the way, genetically, those are wolves. Not red wolves, gray wolves. We took wolves and did that. How much morphological is there? I have no idea. I suspect one. I suspect this is, the Bible doesn't use the word species, it uses the word kind. Yeah. God created different kinds of animals to reproduce within themselves and not with other kinds. 
I don't know how many dinosaur kinds there were, but all of these ceratopsids are similar. They have a beak, they have frill, they have some horns, but this microceratops is not there, protoceratops is not there. There's only some of the ceratopsids. Putting those thoughts together, there are only about 50 basic kinds of dinosaurs. The ceratopsids, the duck-billed hadrosaurs, the tank-like ankylosaurs, the stegosaurs, the long sauropods, the, the meat-eating theropods. Hey, I can, I can tell you what a theropod is. You will not forget this. Ready? This is a theropod. <laughs> these strange animals that clearly ate meat and had these little front legs, and no one knows what those front legs are for. They, they are all these different... The latest one was, well, while traveling in packs, the ones with longer arms got their arms bit off by the other ones, so therefore they evolved smaller arms. All right, whatever. I, mean, I can make a story about anything, but the theropods are our challenge because almost all dinosaurs are plant eaters. Some of them were eating meat. I mean, consider T-Rex. Got six inch long teeth. How would he have originally been described? Is he an herbivore, a carnivore, a scavenger, or an omnivore? Who says the fierce meat eater, B, stalking the Mesozoic plains, looking for whatever he can devour? Who says he eats plants? Who's not going to answer my question? <laughs> this is a trick question. It's a loaded question. And you know, you know, Jesus, when, when the Pharisees tried to ask him a question, he just asked him a question in return. They're like, doom, doom, he got us again. Well, let's do that here. Originally described according to whom? The evolutionists who discovered him and gave him the name Tyrant Lizard King or the Bible? See, Genesis chapter 1 says this. God's talking to Adam. See, I've given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and to every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I've given every green herb for food. And it was so. So Christian, answer this question. Did or did not God create all animals to eat plants? All. I mean, not only different categories, but the word the Hebrew word coal, all, is in here also. Everything that's an air-breathing animal is eating plants. Do we have a problem? Yeah, lions and tigers. Problem, they don't eat plants today. But what about dinosaurs? If they were created to eat plants, why do some eat meat? Without going too much into depth on it, I want to point you to Genesis chapter 3. We know that uh, the Bible says there's no death in the world before Adam rebelled against God. Adam eats the fruit of the knowledge, uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, God says to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. This is a very important passage for biblical Christianity. There was no death, disease, or suffering before Adam rebelled against God. The curse that we all labor in today, under today, is due to our ancestor Adam, which is why Jesus became a curse for us. He took that upon himself, took death upon himself. He didn't have to die. He was sinless, but he died in our place. Okay, a lot of theology there. That's for another lecture. Talk about dinosaurs, though. Here we now have animals that are struggling because they're living in a sin-cursed world. When the chestnut trees went near, I mean, almost extinct, they were the dominant tree and the dominant food source for wildlife in the east of the United States. And a blight hit them, late 1800s, early 1900s, and wiped almost all of them out. There were reports of chipmunks running out on the road and eating roadkill. The chipmunks, little cute little chipmunks, right? That eat acorns. They were hungry. If you looked at what your ancestors ate, ew. Hungry people will eat anything. What happens to animals in a sin cursed world when now there's starvation, now there's drought, now there's problems? 
I can easily imagine them, some of them at least, getting away from the original creation and starting to do things they weren't initially designed to do. But we have to be careful because science is fickle and science will rip the rug right out from underneath us when we're not paying attention. Back in the day, when they found a dinosaur, they chisel the bones out and bring the bones back to the museum and set it up, right, and you charge money and you go look at the museum and it was really cool. But in so doing, they destroyed some world-class bone beds. Paleontologists today are going back and picking up the pieces of the smaller dinosaurs, the mammals, the fish and the plants that the other guys just dug through and just threw to the side. Total disaster. But now when they find a dinosaur, smart paleontologists will step back and look at the rock and sometimes say, wait, look, look, look at that. I can see the outline of the animal's body, meaning he was buried whole and his flesh stained the rocks. And sometimes you say, wait, 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 there's his heart, there's his liver, there's his stomach. Oh, and once they realize that the stomach contents of dinosaurs are often preserved in the rocks, when you find an articulated dinosaur skeleton, they started taking them and looking at, uh, the polishing it, looking under the microscope to see what he was eating. And most of the theropod dinosaurs have stomachs packed with plants, despite the pointy teeth. I thought they were carnivores. I would have said they were carnivores. They got these teeth and these muscles and these, you know, they look like the, the eyes in the front of their head, like a carnivore, not off the side of their head, like an herbivore who's always looking out for the carnivores. Let me give you a more modern example. When a black bear can't get into your trash can, what do black bears eat out in the wild? 99% of their diet is plants. What do polar bears eat out in the wild? Fish, seals, occasionally a person. 99% uh, of a polar bear's diet is meat, and the other bears are in between. They have the same claws. They have the same teeth. Hey guys, have you ever been asked to hang up a, a picture on the wall? And, and you go to your, your shop and you, you're, you know, you're the man, so you're all triumphant and I can hang this picture. So you get that little, little, little drawer out of your, your thing that has all the screws and nuts in it. And it's got those little plastic things that you stick into the drywall and you have the screw in them. And so you go up to the wall and you know you have to poke a hole in the wall, put the little plastic thing in there and then put the screw in there and tighten it, right? And you always forget your screwdriver. I'm sorry, you always forget your hammer. Always. So you're like, oh, I gotta poke a hole in the hammer. Ah, so what you do is you take your screwdriver and you turn it around and you hold up a screw and you go pop, 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 and you poke a hole with your screwdriver. You ever do that? What did you just do? You just used a tool for something it wasn't designed to do, but it worked just fine, right? You've heard of adaptation, that taking something and morphing its use or exaptation is taking a tool and using it for something it wasn't designed for, like bear claws that are really good for digging up roots. They're also really good for on the seal. Those teeth, a black bear could take a blueberry branch and go like this and, go, and strip the blueberries off and leave the leaves on the stem. Those same teeth can rip whale blubber. Exaptation. Animals spreading out on earth after the flood, specifically for this case, going to all these different environments I think there's some adaptation here because you know what, that, that white uh, coat color on the polar bear probably wasn't an original color. In fact, genetically, we found cave bears in Ireland that are similar genetically to polar bears, like ancient cave bears, not living ones. So it looks like polar bears evolved, I hate that word, from regular old bears. And one reason they're white is because a mutation occurred in their coat color genes. A very advantageous mutation. Because white fur is great on ice. It would be terrible in a forest. Brown and black is great in a forest. It would be terrible on ice. I mean, a seal pops up, he could see a polar bear if it was black you know, miles away. But a white polar bear could be sitting right there and a seal might not even notice him until it's too late. So adaptation plus exaptation and we have a recipe for change over time. Apply that to dinosaurs, which we don't have any examples of because they're all dead. 
but I think the same rules can apply there also. You okay with that? Okay, but we know some dinosaurs are eating meat. This is a uh, T-Rex tooth embedded in a duck-billed dinosaur's tailbone, but it healed up, meaning this hadrosaur survived a T-Rex attack and then walked around the rest of his life in a tremendous amount of pain. It's really sad, but it's also really amazing. Now, skipping over a lot of details here, let's just, you know, God creates ad uh, dinosaurs with Adam and Eve. They're on the earth before the flood. That means that they would be on the earth at the flood. Therefore, many, many, many dinosaurs should have drowned. Is there any evidence for that? Actually, there's a lot, and you've seen it right here. You've seen dinosaurs in this pose. We, when we find an attacked dinosaur, almost always it's like this, which is bizarre because when animals die on the ground, they don't do that. Cows and squirrels and kitty cats, they don't curl up backwards like that. What is going on? Well, turns out that a lot of long-necked animals have a structure. It's called the ligamentum elasticum. An elastic ligament is a rubber band. It runs from the base of the skull down the spine. If they have a long tail, it runs down the tail. So dinosaurs didn't necessarily need muscles to hold their head up. Uh, so yeah, they had a, a rubber band to hold their head up. Boing, boing, boing. That's really smart. Well, some scientists a couple years ago, they were studying chickens, and they realized when you take a dead chicken and put it in water, it does that. And they started scratching their head and thinking, oh, a chicken has a rubber band to hold his head up. You, you, know, you, you, you take your finger and run it down the spine sometimes to get that little bit of meat off. That's what we're talking about. It's not a lot, but it's just enough for a chicken head. Hold it up. That means that when the chicken is in water, it doesn't weigh as much, but that rubber bandy thing is still pulling with the same force. So the natural response is to curl up like that. So now the evolutionary paleontologists are looking at the classic dead dinosaur posture as evidence of drowning. And this explains why dinosaurs are very often buried with fish. These are land animals that obviously drown. Okay, next question for you. Are dinosaurs in the Bible? Is the word dinosaur in the Bible? No. Uh, the word wasn't invented until the 1800s anyway. The Bible had already been translated into English at least five times by this point. So it couldn't have appeared in any of the early English translations. Modern translators, they, they wrestle. There is a word called tanin in Hebrew. Um, it basically means dragon. Some translations will translate it sea monsters. Some will translate it jackal. They're not going to put the word dinosaur in the Bible. Just, they're not going to. But theoretically, it could be there. If you ever read the, um, uh, the original introduction to the first edition of the King James Bible, there's a, a thing called From the Translators to the Reader. It is an amazing document. It is worth reading because it explains how these scholars were struggling to take this language and turn it into the other language, English, early English. But in there, they said, you know, there are a lot of examples of minerals and animals that are only used once. We don't know what those things are. Now, since that time, we've discovered a lot more Hebrew manuscripts, and so we have examples of other ones. But from context, you could know that that's a mineral or an animal. And so you different translations, you know, King James might say basilisk. ESV might say ostrich. ES, uh, NIV might say owl. You know what that means? It's an animal. But we don't know which one. So the Bible might accidentally be mentioning dinosaurs and we don't know it because we lost the definition of the word. Wow. But you look at the book of Job. Do you know that Job is a lawsuit? Job sues God and God appears on his own defense. And what does he do? He grills Job about all these science questions you know the, the, the song, the heavenly storehouse is laden with snow. You know, you know that, right? That's from Job. 
And at the end, what does Job say? I put my hand over my mouth. Amen. Grilled by God about basic facts of science. Wow. But in that, after all this snow and all this other kind of stuff, God says this. Behold, behemoth. Have you trained yourself that when you see a non-English word in your Bibles that you translate that word? What's behemoth in Hebrew? He said, behold, the beast of beasts, which I made as I made you. Oh, wow, that's a reference to creation right there. He eats grass. Oh, he's an herbivore, like an ox. He's got strength in his loins and power in the muscle of his belly. I don't care what translation you use, they all... Ten of them I looked at, they all use the phrase, his tail is like a cedar. Now, that's not very impressive to an American. The cedar trees in Georgia are scrubby little things that grow up in old fields. You've got cedar trees around here, right? But the cedar trees to Job were the largest possible trees that he could have seen. If the Bible says he's got a tail like a sequoia, you know exactly what that's getting at. If you compare this part of the animal, to the largest possible tree you can know of, obviously he's saying he's got a big old tail. Now, scientifically, we don't know that Job 40 is describing sauropod dinosaurs. However, if you looked at all the animals living and extinct, the largest land animals that God created deserve the title Beast of Beasts. They were herbivores. They would have been extremely strong, and they had a tail like a cedar of Lebanon. Interesting. All right, another question for you. Sorry, wrong way. Does Noah have a problem? How do we get animals of this size on Noah's Ark? Christian, is this intimidating? Is this embarrassing? Do you know how to answer this? Babies, Babies is one. Excellent, excellent choice. Let me give you several possibilities. First, within each of the dinosaur kinds, about 50 basic kinds, there are little species and big species. Here's Constantinopolis. He's the size of a chicken. So Noah could have taken the smaller species within each kind. Fine, maybe. In fact, the average size dinosaur is about the size of a pony. Yeah, there's some big ones. Fine. There are a lot of little ones. We don't hear about the little ones very often. Second, babies. Now, I don't think Don uh, Noah would have taken eggs on board, but he could have taken hatchlings. He could have taken juveniles. He could have taken teenagers. He didn't have to take great, great, great granddaddy Apatosaurus who's near the end of his life and is, you know, 80 feet long. He could have taken the smaller versions. But think about this also. How many of each kind did Noah have to take? Two. two. How many basic kinds of dinosaurs? 50. What's two times 50? Oh, he's only got to take about 100 dinosaurs. And... Given the size of Noah's Ark, there's plenty of room even for the big ones. Plus all the food and water they need, not for 40 days and 40 nights, but for an entire year that they were on board. It's actually not a problem even if you take the biggest ones. So it's an intimidating question that works out when you just calculate the size of the earth. It just gets easier as you consider that you could have taken smaller versions or uh, juveniles. Piece of cake. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this earlier. Uh, do you see that ankylosaur there? Hey, do you see this ankylosaur built like a tank? They don't form the dead dinosaur posture. They can't arch backwards. But most of them are found upside down. Because when you take something top heavy and put it in water, it flips over as it sinks. So they drowned also. Another question for you. You tired of my questions yet? Consider that all of the largest land animals that have ever lived are extinct. The six-foot-tall penguins, the double-sized platypuses, the Andean condors. I mean, I've, I've actually held a California condor in my arm. Uh, they're amazingly huge birds, but the wingspan is probably less than the wingspan of one wing of this extinct condor. Why are all the largest things extinct? Why are things today always smaller? And we're talking about the big things that used to live. 
Well, ecology. If you're large, you need a lot of food. You can't survive a drought. If you're large, genetically, you're going to be outcompeted by the small versions within your species. If you have to delay reproduction until you grow big, the things that don't delay reproduction, like a regular condor, maybe it's, it's mature in one year and this guy has to wait 10 years. How many generations of regular condors would you have? How many offspring would you have? There would be tens of thousands of small condors before this guy lays his first egg. Girl lays her first egg. So genetically, all species should be driving towards smaller, faster reproducing forms. Now, I'm not answering actually what happened to the dinosaurs, but I'm giving you many possibilities. All I know is that they're not here today. But if they were on the Earth, there should be some evidence that man interacted with them. A lot of creationists have used examples that I'm not a big fan of. So let me give you my favorite examples, the ones I would actually trust. One, this is the tomb of Bishop Bell, who died 600 years ago. He's buried in the floor of Carlisle Cathedral in England. And in this tomb, you can see this rectangle that goes around, a piece is like worn and broken off. But in the pieces that have survived, we see all these carvings. There's a bat. There's a dog with a collar, a racing dog. There is a fish. There's a bird, not just any bird, it's a wading bird with reeds and things. Does anyone disagree with me on those definitions of what these animals are? Did the person carving these know what these things look like? Now, they're not perfect, right? I mean, it's kind of hard to carve a bat in, in brass, but obviously that's a bat, right? Uh, this looks like two sauropod dinosaurs with their necks. This one's neck is right here. Their necks are wrapped around each other. Notice how they're standing up. This guy on the left has spikes on his tail. We have found two different species of sauropod dinosaurs with what's called a thagomizer after a Gary Larson cartoon. That is a Spinophorosaurus, I think. That's amazing. In fact, this, this motif of two sauropod-like dragons with their necks wrapped around each other is very common in ancient artwork. But they look a little distorted until you realize that, well, consider Tanistrophius. What a weird animal that was. If I was going to invent a mythological animal, I would have a hard time inventing a mythological animal that had any characteristics of an animal that really did live. And we see this a lot. In fact, taking away the modern dragon legends that they breathe fire and cast magic spells, most of the ancient stories, and there are thousands of them around the world, of dragons are very matter-of-fact accounts of humans interacting with big reptiles. And the reptile usually loses. Sometimes a couple of people get killed, but they're not laying waste to entire cities. They're impacting a farming community and everyone runs out and they stab the thing to death. Just saying. Back in um, Southeast Asia, the former capital city of the Khmer Empire, which was at the time the largest city on earth, Angkor Wat, centuries ago before it collapsed. It collapsed because of a drought and their entire brilliant and amazing system of regulating water for rice farming collapsed when they didn't have enough water and the jungle took over this ancient city. But now that the wars in Southeast Asia are died down, archeologists are going back and hacking back the jungle and exposing all these things that had disappeared. This is the, um, the top prom temple. And in the door frame of this temple, you can see there's like a, a demon-y thing, there's a water buffalo, there's a couple of people, and then there's that thing. What's your first reaction when you see that? Sure looks like a stegosaur to me. Now, its head is too big. But notice he's standing up and he's got the plates on his back. But, okay, his head is too big. whoop de doo Right around the corner from this, someone has found another stegosaur that looks more like a stegosaur than this one does. Did someone see or have some cultural memory of Marco Polo claimed that the Emperor of China had two dragons to pull his chariot. What? Alexander the Great claimed that his soldiers were scared away by a giant hissing reptile in a desert. What? There's lots and lots and lots of dragon legends from around the world. 
but very strangely, they match dinosaurs. Their shape, their behavior, etc. Next question for you. Was there an age of dinosaurs? This is a picture we see often. Notice, there's no mammals in this picture. There's no birds in this picture. There's no grass in this picture. I was even taught in graduate school, grasses didn't evolve until 35 million years ago. You know, grasses that dominate the world today, everything from bamboo to stuff in your, in your lawn, grasses. If dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, grasses didn't appear until fairly recently. And they say that because grasses aren't in the fossil record, except we found them in dinosaur dung. We have hundreds of thousands, probably millions of what are called coprolites, petrified dinosaur piles. And that's weird because, you know, have you ever gotten out in your backyard and trip over a pile of fossilized dog mess? No, that stuff does not last very long. And yet we have so many from dinosaurs, we know what species they came from. And how do you like this for a job? What do you do? Uh, I polish dinosaur poop. <laughs> um, you can take them and cut them and polish them and look under a microscope and see what's in there. And you can see what they were eating. Some of them have crunched up bones. Most of them have plants. And we have found all of the major families of grasses in dinosaur dung, even though they don't exist anywhere else in the fossil record until late. The fossil record is fickle. Some things are preserved. Some things aren't. But this picture is completely wrong because we have found as many species of mammals buried with the fossil record, buried with dinosaurs in the fossil record as we found species of dinosaurs, including these few examples. Now the guy on the left is not a flying squirrel. There are, you know how they're marsupial mammals and they're placental mammals? Right, you got the, the possum who has the pouch and the babies are half born when they come out. And you have the, the placental mammals who have the, um, uh, the placenta on the, in the womb. There are two very different types of mammals. Well, there's another. In, amongst the multi-tuberculus is all these mammals that look kind of like the others also. Just like the Tasmanian wolf and the lion are very hard to tell apart unless you really pay attention. Well, these other groups of mammals are there too. So here's a flying squirrel equivalent from the Mesozoic. There's a platypus jaw. Now, remember, <clears throat> oh sorry, MA, that's magic math in the evolutionary model. This is for mega annum, millions of years ago. So they claim that they found this platypus jaw from 120 million years ago. That's 60 million years before the dinosaurs went extinct. That's before most of the dinosaurs supposedly evolved. From here on out, any picture with dinosaurs should have a picture of a platypus with it. Here's a badger-like creature. He has a baby Psittacosaurus in his stomach. So on the morning of Noah's flood, that mammal ate a dinosaur for breakfast. There's a beaver-like creature. He's preserved with his hairs. Oh, that question, do dinosaurs have feathers? We're getting there, hold on. But if mammals can be buried with hair, then if dinosaurs had feathers, we should see it. Here's a hedgehog-like creature, now hedgehogs, they're unique. No other animal is shaped like a hedgehog. No other animal has hairs like a hedgehog. That animal, not only is the size and shape of a hedgehog, his hairs are preserved in the rock also. Predating the evolution of most dinosaurs. This is not what I was taught even in graduate school. I was taught, oh yeah, uh, some mammalologist no longer believes that. But that knowledge hasn't filtered down to the popular regular old people yet. They don't really want you to unthink what they've been telling you for 100 years. Have you ever seen the movie uh, with Kevin Costner, Hidden Figures? A great movie about these African-American women who NASA was using for computers before computers existed. They're really good with math. Those ladies got our astronauts to the moon with a pencil and paper and a slide rule. Well, there is a NASA facility in Maryland that really does exist, and women really do work there. <laughs> the world's changed, kidding. Um, <laughs> walk away now. Um, <clears throat> this guy was dropping his wife off a couple years ago, and she walks in the building, and he looks over into the woods at this pile of basically rubble that they had used when they dug the building. They threw all the material off to the side, and the woods grew up around it. 
And he's found this rock. It's about this big. It's one of the world-class fossil discoveries ever. On that rock, there are sauropod footprints, nodosaur footprints, a nodosaur coprolite, which is a fossilized dung, a bone from a nodosaur uh, skin. A lot of dinosaurs are armor-plated. But then we also have pterosaur footprints and, in blue, mammal footprints. Not only did they live at the same time, they lived on top of each other. But also, this means that fossils aren't just bones. We fossilized behavior within a community of species. That's cool. Mammals have to be included in any dinosaur from here on out, any dinosaur depiction from here on out. All right, now let's talk about birds. Birds are very diverse creatures, but the fossil record of birds is much more diverse than the number of bird species we have today. There's a bewildering array of birds and bird-like creatures in the fossil record. Just saying, that's, that's just a fact. A lot of the ancient birds have claws on their wings, teeth. But that's funny because one modern bird called the Hoatzin, or the stink bird of South America, has fully functional wing claws. Something else weird about the Hoatzin. Um, you've eaten chicken. When you have to get the white meat off the chicken, there's a thing on the sternum, right? You got a, it's a keel there. You know what the keel is for? That doesn't work great in chickens, but for regular birds that can fly well, that makes a triangle. It's an mu extra muscle attachment point. It makes the, the chest muscle stronger, helps them to fly. We have a flat breastbone, one reason why humans will never fly. Our, mu our chest muscles cannot possibly be strong enough to propel us in through the air. But the Hoatzin also has a flat breastbone, just like Archaeopter Archaeopteryx did. Archaeopteryx also had wing claws. Now it had teeth. But there's something else about birds. What's the difference between a bill and a jaw? Look, I can't move my upper jaw, but a bird can move its upper bill. So we're talking about the evolution of reptiles to mammals. If it has a bill, I'm calling it a bird. If it's got feathers, I'm calling it a bird. Whether or not it has claws or teeth or a, stern, a flat or a keeled sternum, that's irrelevant. But if it looks like it can fly, it's a bird. The, the thing is, the fossil record is full of a diverse array of extinct species. What we see today is depauperate, the remnants, the bare survivals, survivors of a very rich world that God had created. So I'm not, I'm not struggling here that we find strange birds like Confucius soreness, beak, claws, tail feathers. Ah. Have you ever been, um, you, you come home and your Labrador retriever is happy to see you and he's wagging his tail and a tail, oh man, you stupid dog, get out of here. Oh. Why does it hurt when a dog's tail whacks you? Because it's got bones in his tail. It's an extension of his spinal cord, spinal column. Birds don't have that. What's on the rear end of a chicken? Right? You've seen plucked chickens. You ever looked at the, the butt of a chicken? What's there? It's this little thing. It's called a pygostyle. It's only got a couple of bones. And if a bird has a tail, it's just feathers. So a peacock's tail is just feathers stuck on this little bone attached with a little muscle so he can lift his tail up. Reptiles tend to have long bony tails. This guy looks like a bird, but look at the date, 130 million years ago. I was also taught that birds, yes, primitive birds existed at the end of the dinosaur era, and after the dinosaurs went extinct, that's when birds evolved into all the modern birds. That is a fully functional bird from way deep in the, the fossil record. Here is Hunchanornis, Bill, Long, uh, slender arms, tail feathers staining the rocks. And Shionis Huxleyi. This is, they split the rock in half. That's the left and right of the same fossils. Can you see the feathers? Can you see feathers in the fossil record? Very clearly. These are not fakes. These are birds with feathers. How many examples do we need? This is amazing. The only bird ever find fossilized with an egg inside. But the eggs, look on the left here, 
has multiple layers of eggshell. Why? If you stress a bird and keep on like chasing it and don't let it lay its egg, every day or half a day or whatever it is, it'll lay another layer of eggshell down. So the only bird we've ever discovered with an egg inside it was stressed for several days before it finally died. That's cool. It's cruel, but it's cool at the same time. Here's another one. Now, I know you can't tell much from this fossil, but can you see the little bird legs and the, the, the wings folded like that and the feathers? And the reason this is important because his lungs are preserved. Your lungs are not like bird lungs. We breathe with what's called a diaphragm. Go, <gasps> and the air comes about this far down, and then the oxygen has to diffuse into the lower parts of the lung, and the carbon dioxide has to diffuse upwards. We're not very good at pulling oxygen out of the air. That's why we can't run a one-minute mile. Can't do it. We cannot pull enough oxygen out. Birds can, because the air doesn't have a dead spot. The air in a bird lung, yeah, it might be coming in out the nose. It flows all the way through the lung and out the bottom and comes around the sides before it comes back out again. There's no dead spot there. So between the sternum, or the keel, the light uh, hollow bone structure, the very light feathers, and the, the through lung, that's why birds can fly. Reptiles don't have a lung like ours, and they don't have a lung like a bird either. Reptiles use what's called the hepatic pump. Hepatic has to do with the liver. They move their liver in and out. And that's how they push air in and out of their lungs. So the first step in the evolution of birds from a reptile would be to poke a hole in the bottom of the lung, and then animal dies. This is a massive problem because the bird lung would be completely unnecessary in any normal, normal reptile. They would never evolve that and go through all that trouble. Why on earth would that ever happen? Because evolution has no forethought. It can't say, oh, if I poke a hole and do this and do that and do that, in millions of years I can get an avian lung. That's not the way evolution works. It's supposed to be random, and each step has to be survivable. The bird lung is a big problem. Did birds evolve from dinosaurs? I don't believe for a second they evolved from dinosaurs, and that's one of the main reasons. However, consider humans. What species is most like a human? A chimpanzee. They look like us. They act like us in many ways. They eat the same foods we eat. Now, they're stupid. They never left the rainforest. We flew to the moon, so obviously we're not just, just monkeys. But if you were to look at all the species in the world, clearly we cluster or group with chimpanzees first. And then the next group outside of that is gorillas, orangutans, other monkeys, other mars uh, you know, marmosets and things like that. And then all the mammals, and then all the things with a backbone, and then all of animalia. So we can group upon group upon group upon group of all sorts of different creatures. And taxonomy is really fun. But clearly, humans are placental vertebrate mammals and we cluster with chimpanzees. I, that does not surprise me and it does not make me struggle. Do the same things with birds and they cluster with a specific group of reptiles. They're not turtles, they're not crocodiles, they're not all dinosaurs. They cluster with a specific group of, of dinosaurs. There are some of these dinosaurs that look very bird-like, and some of the birds look kind of dinosaur-like, and it's hard to tell them apart sometimes. And I'm okay with that. But birds are warm-blooded. Reptiles aren't. Birds lay hard eggs. Reptiles don't. And birds can fly. Yeah, the pterosaurs could fly using completely different mechanisms. Different mechanisms. I do not for a second believe that birds evolve from dinosaurs, but they do morphologically cluster with dinosaurs. Are you okay with that? God can do what he wants, and he created hierarchically. Clearly, he created hierarchically. God loves order. He goes dinka, 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 in all these different groups. Okay. I remember when I was a young man, seeing pictures like this. And I might have said, the evolution of dinosaurs is obvious. Look at the fossil record. Here we've got the Mesozoic era, the Triassic, the Jurassic, Cretaceous. We have all these dinosaurs. Look, they go all the way back to a common ancestor. 
evolution's a fact. Yeah, well, um, someone once pointed out to me, hey, Rob, look what happens when you cover up everything they actually don't know. That was all the dotted lines in that former picture. Yeah, there's no evolution of dinosaurs here. There's 50 family groups, 50 created kinds. You've heard of the missing link? There are missing links between almost every group of animal in the whole entire fossil record and almost every other group of animal. And the, the missing links that they claim today are not the ones they claimed when I was growing up. And those weren't the ones they claimed in 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial. And those weren't the ones they claimed in Charles Darwin's day. The average lifespan of a missing link might be 10 years before it's pushed off to the side. So the fact that there are claimed missing links today, okay, fine. Give me 10 years, I bet half of your examples will not be believed anymore, Mr. Evolutionist, even by the evolutionary community. But I'm gonna do something here. I'm gonna draw red lines on all these. I'm gonna shove everything off to the side. And I'm gonna keep the, the time frame there because I want to put all the mammals and birds I just showed you into this context. That's the same data. That's where I, I was taught mammals and birds. Oh, and this is now what we believe about mammals and birds. And I put a question mark after bird because we don't have many fossilized birds. Birds don't fossilize well. They're just too light. They don't get caught up and buried in rock and turned into stone. But of the ones we found, we pushed the origin of birds way back. And I was taught that I think it's like, this group here was the group that evolved into birds, but hey, um, if birds evolved from dinosaurs, when did that happen? The evolutionists might have run out of time. By the way, um, have you ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies? Um, almost every one of those dinosaurs is Cretaceous. Never ask me to watch sci-fi with you. Don't do it. <laughs> Shut up, Rob. Just shut up. I keep telling myself that. And I can't, I, no, I can't believe, like the movie Stargate, I'm getting off a little tangent here. One of the opening lines, we've carbon dated this unknown metal. <laughs> Carbon's a non-metal, dude. What are you talking about? Anyway, something like that in a movie, and it's just downhill from there. Anyway. Uh, not only have they found as many species of mammals buried with dinosaurs as species of dinosaurs, but they found big ones. This is fairly new. This is a rhinoceros-sized mammal that they found in the Triassic layers. All right, let's get to this question. Did dinosaurs, it, did not dinosaurs have feathers? One, this is Sinoceropteryx. It's the poster child of the feathered dinosaurs. This is the first one discovered and the first one claimed discovered and they beat us over the head with this for a number of years. But Alan Fiducia, who's an evolutionist, who believes in evolution, he just does not believe that modern birds evolved from dinosaurs, looks at this under a microscope and he says, wait a minute, I can see the animal's skin and this fuzz is under the animal's skin. And he says, and it's obvious to anyone who looks. Why was that not obvious to the first people who discovered this fossil and were using it to claim feathered dinosaurs? because they wanted to see feathered dinosaurs. Hey, um, does the Bible say that dinosaurs did not have feathers? No. Therefore, I don't care if they have feathers or not. If they have feathers, cool. If they don't have feathers, great. It doesn't bother me whatsoever either way. But if they don't have feathers, that takes away one of the big evolutionary talking points. Okay? The upper two pictures, um, this is a velociraptor arm bone. This second picture is that, that right there. You see these, these six arrows, and you can't even see them. I can barely see them. There's little teeny dots on the bone. These lower two are the wing bone of a turkey vulture. Now birds, this is not true of penguins, or ostriches, or even albatrosses. Because albatrosses, they don't stick their feathers up when they're turning. So when they come for landing, they tend to crash. But when they get airborne, they're one of the most graceful flyers in the whole of the bird world. They just don't, they don't have much control. Just like a plane, when it's coming in for landing, it changes the shape of the wing as it's coming down or when it's taking off. Birds do the same thing, but it takes muscles. 
And those muscles attach to the bone on these knobs. I, I'm not sure if it's the pulling of, the, of the, um, the muscle that creates the knob or if the knob's there and the muscle just attaches to it, but it's called a quill knob. Not all flying birds have quill knobs. The non-flying birds do not have quill knobs. Nobody believes a velociraptor could fly. Why would velociraptors have quill knobs even if they have feathers? Don't know. What I'm saying is I'm entirely unconvinced. Those might be quill knobs. I don't think they are. But I don't know. No one knows. We need a lot more work on the subject. But we know T. rex did not have feathers. Because what's a feather? It's like a hyper-complex hair. Hairs come up out of little holes in the skin. Well, feather needs to come up out of a big old hole because the feather shaft is usually pretty wide. And then it unfurls. Feathers are amazing. But if there's feathers, there'd be evidence for it in any of the skin fossils we find of dinosaurs. Because scales are just bumps in the skin. A feather is not a scale. Feathers did not evolve from scales. They have no relationship whatsoever. And T. rex, according to the several fossils of the skin we found, has no evidence of feathers. Okay, what if none of this matters? What if I could show you that dinosaur fossils cannot be millions of years old? If they cannot be millions of years old, evolution isn't true. And all this, this whole debate about feathered dinosaurs is totally irrelevant. These are some electron microscope pictures that uh, two of my friends took. It was actually published in an evolutionary journal. This is done under the auspices of the Creation Research Society, of which I'm on the board of directors, with our iDino project. This is the inside of a triceratops horn. These blobs with the spikes, yeah, we know what those are. Those are called osteoblasts. Those are bone cells. Bone cells intact? after 65 to 70 million years? No, man. Here's um, the inside of a T-Rex leg bone from that same formation in Montana, found by evolutionists with flexible tissue. Actually, it still stank. Blood vessels, red blood cells. And interestingly, uh, humans don't have any nuclei in our red blood cells, but reptiles do. The same laboratory a couple years later publish these pictures. Now this is my field. This is genetics. I have used this stain. It's called DAPI, that green fluorescent stain. I have used this. What it does, it's a flat molecule that sticks into DNA in the double helix of DNA. So you wash your cells with it and then you wash them with water and any place where the stain is not stuck will wash away. And then you look under, under a fluorescent microscope, you know, blue light with a filter and it, it shines green. That's evidence of DNA inside dinosaur cells. Clearly, but wait a minute, bacteria have DNA. Well, the pictures on the right are using a stain for a protein that bacteria do not have. But you have this protein, and reptiles have this protein. It's called a histone. It's a protein your DNA wraps around inside their nucleus. They've also found every time they've sampled carbon-14 dating on dinosaur bones, Dinosaur bones contain carbon-14. They usually date to about 30,000 years ago, which is not possible. But if there was almost no carbon-14 in the pre-flood world, and the carbon dioxide level is like 16 times higher than they are today, that means there should have been proportionally less carbon-14. So if a dinosaur that was alive in the pre-flood world died, and now we go and we carbon-14 date it, it's gonna have less carbon-14 than a modern animal should. So yeah, it dates to, dates to 30,000 years ago. Okay, what does it mean? It means it's not millions of years old, Mr. Evolutionist. That's your problem, not mine. So between the DNA, the soft tissue, and the carbon-14 in dinosaur bones, clearly these things did not die out 65 million years ago. Science is actually on the side of the creationists in this case. I hope you're encouraged about that. I certainly am. All right. Wow, I talked too long. Lots more information in Creation Magazine. Lots more information on creation.com. In fact, if you would ask me, you know, where do I go for answers? I'd say, go to your Bibles first, then go to creation.com, and then take a look at some of our books. Here's one. 
Untold Secrets of Planet Earth, Dire Dragons. Very interesting book. The author goes all around the world taking photographs of dragon pictures, carvings, um, etchings, pots. And then he has an artist draw a picture of a known species of dinosaur in a similar pose. Very, very curious. Very convincing. Here's Exploring Geology with Mr. Hibb. It's a little cricket. He's going around the world looking at rocks and fossils and minerals. We also have Exploring Dinosaurs with Mr. Hibb on the table right there, right next to it. Great book for kids. This is um, middle school level probably. Here's some little kid books, the Please Nana books. Now, the lady there is a real woman. I know her. And this really is her granddaughter. And these are real conversations that they've had. And whoa, I mean, what is death? Who is God? Why was Jesus born? What's a miracle? These are really, in fact, it, it's written in poetry too. It's a really good uh, nighttime reading for a child because you know what? Even children ask the hard questions. And when they ask that hard question, they've already been thinking about it for a long time. So mom and dad, oh, how do you answer it? This might help you a little bit. Here's another children's pack, a bunch of you know, hardcover children's books. You know, it is really hard to write books for children because parents are really picky. And we have to be very careful in what we say theologically because all the red flags are there. But these have been successfully tested on the world and people don't write back to us, you heretics, I can't believe you said X. We try to avoid all those arguments and just focus on creation, uh, the Bible, and basic answers like that. All right, as before, I'm gonna leave you with 1 Peter 3.15. I hope you've seen me try to model this. I know I have a temper, I know I do but I'm told something here that makes me say maybe I shouldn't use my temper and yell at people when they're insulting me. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. You know, harsh and sarcastic facts shouted in anger don't usually point someone towards the kingdom of God. But even an answer like this, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I'm going to go to creation.com and I'm going to read some articles and I'm going to come back tomorrow and we're going to keep on talking. That's a perfectly acceptable answer. You don't have to know it on the spot because they don't expect you to come back. Hmm. All right. Um, I'm here for the rest of the evening. I'm not sure if we wanted a question and answer session or not or if we're just going to quit and talk out in the hallway. What was the answer? Quit and talk out in the hallway? Okay, would you like to close? Yes. All right, here we go. Thank you all much. It's been a pleasure being here with you this morning, today. I hope you learned and I hope you're encouraged and I hope you do take a look at some of the resources CMI has.